You're listening to the Love That Neighborhood podcast. This type of storytelling and journalism is made possible by people just like you. So to keep this content coming to your podcast feed, head over to lovethatneighborhood.org slash podcast and donate today. Again, to support our work, head over to lovethatneighborhood.org slash podcast and donate now. Okay, Jesse, have you heard of this thing called the Summer Offensive. This is like a football team? <laughs> a team? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> is it like a sport? <laughs> no. No. This has nothing to do with sports. Okay. I don't do sports, so that's perfect. I know. Uh, I wish that it was related to sports, uh, but no, actually, um, this term is related to war. Oh, okay. And the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan last August. So that takeover has been called the 2021 Taliban Offensive or the Summer Offensive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it essentially like ended the war that the United States had been fighting for, I don't know, 20 years? Yeah, just about 20 years. And we evacuated thousands of military troops when that happened. But also needing evacuating were thousands of Afghan citizens fleeing the threat of war and violence. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the U.S. had like a huge influx of like Afghan people recently. I -hmm. I know even like I think Louisville even had a big influx. Like We did. Yeah. So how many came? So over 100,000 Afghan refugees have come to the United States in the last seven months. And about 1,500 of those have come to Kentucky and about 500 have come right here to Louisville. Oh, yeah, that's a pretty significant number. I mean, good grief, 100,000 people in the United States, 500 in Louisville alone. Okay, this makes sense then, because you had said that you wanted to revisit this episode on refugees. Right. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's revisit an old episode about refugees, because that's going to help us know how to respond and how to love our neighbors from other countries in the midst of crisis. Yeah, I think that is actually a great idea. So this is an episode that originally aired back in November 2017. And I recently spoke with John Barnett, who appears in this episode, about what the church is currently doing to help with the Afghan crisis. So stick around for that at the end of the episode. And just a heads up, this episode does contain descriptions of war and violence. So you might want to screen the material before letting your kiddos listen. All right. Here is episode number six, where the gospel meets refugees. You're listening to the Love That Neighborhood podcast. I'm Jesse Eubanks. And I'm Kevin Jones. Each episode, we hear stories of social justice and Christian community. Today's episode, where the gospel meets refugees, we're going to hear what it would take for someone to leave everything they've ever known behind and come to a place they've never been, and what would happen if Christians were the ones waiting for them when they got there. Welcome to our corner of the urban universe. Trump's travel ban officially took effect in late June. Protection of the nation from foreign terrorists. I think a key question is going to be whether or not the Supreme Court even issues a ruling. In every potential threat. And that's the key point in this. No hate. We're not no fear. Refugees are welcome here. No hate. No fear. We've all heard those famous words engraved on our Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. But this idea of welcoming those who aren't our own isn't an American concept. It's not even a man-made concept. The practice of welcoming strangers is God's idea. After the Israelites have been freed from Egypt, God starts laying out all the laws for them as their own nation. He speaks to Moses chapter after chapter, giving them specific, very specific details on how God wants his nation to operate. In the midst of this conversation, God says this in Leviticus 19. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. Part of God's vision for his people was not just to love their fellow Israelites, whom God had clearly chosen, but to love every one of their neighbors coming in. We, of all people, should be on the front lines of welcoming strangers, but in reality, the exact opposite is true. So there was a recent study from the Barner Group that shows that only 16% of evangelicals agree that we should welcome in refugees during a crisis. 
think about that for a second, 16%. That means that almost nine out of 10 evangelicals believe that when a crisis is going on, we should not be welcoming in refugees. Why is there such a gap between our attitude and God's attitude shown in Leviticus 19? Because we have laws and restrictions and many man-made constraints. Yeah, so politics, you know, politics are important. We need politics. But a lot of times we create these politics as a way to protect ourselves from having to get personally involved. So this idea of refugees and helping other people that we don't know, that have cultures that we don't understand, it just scares us. So a lot of our politics are really just about making sure that we feel safe and protected. But we're not here to talk about politics. Today, we're going to talk about people. And for a guy named Eric Allen, he was about to find out what welcoming a refugee really meant. And we had five couples, five families, including my wife and I. Eric is a Christian who lives just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, and he and other folks in his church were wondering what to do in the midst of this refugee crisis. And that's when they heard about an organization called Refuge Louisville. Now, the city of Louisville is one of the top 10 refugee resettlement cities in the country. As a matter of fact, since 2011, Louisville has welcomed more than 10,000 refugees. So Refuge seeks to help churches get connected with the thousands of refugees coming to our city. So to get involved in the refugee crisis, Eric and his friends decided to volunteer with Refuge. So we discussed it, talked about it, and said, we're in, sign us up. Eric and his team volunteered as a welcome team. They would go through some basic trainings and background checks, and then they would wait for Refuge to match them with an incoming refugee family. And Eric and his team would meet this family whenever they finally arrived at the airport. They thought they would have a bunch of time to prepare, but things ended up happening a lot faster than they had planned for. We received a call on a Friday. Can you take this family on Tuesday? All of our team had not even been through the training yet. And I've got to tell you, there was a little bit of apprehension, a little bit of, I don't know if we can do this. And they were apprehensive because of this. Not only would Eric and his team be picking up this refugee family at the airport, they would also take turns visiting this family once a week for at least three months because they were going to be helping them with whatever they needed to get settled and acclimated to life in America. It was a really big commitment. So that Tuesday, Eric and his team were sitting at the airport waiting for this refugee family. So we had all these questions, all this uncertainty. It'll, it'll be interesting. Just yeah. have to roll with, roll with it. Oh gosh, you know, they're coming today. What does that mean tomorrow? You know, I mean, what's going to happen? They weren't the only people there waiting. A staff member from Refuge came along as well as a translator. But because everything had happened in a rush, no one really knew much about the family, where they were from, or if they knew any English. All Eric knew was that they had a lot of kids. So as they're waiting, really with no idea who it is they should be looking for, the staff member from Refuge suddenly stands up and announces, there's our family. Hi, how's it going? Say so de wo. So de wo. Okay. So de wo. Hi. Hi. So de wo. So I like your hat. I like your hat. <laughs> it's good. It's <laughs> good. It's very good. They arrived. They were a large family of seven with children. They have everything that they own in a few suitcases and their children in their arms. The father can speak a little English, but not much. The translator with them at the airport learns finally that the family is from Ethiopia and has spent the last eight years in a refugee camp in Kenya. So with luggage and kids in tow, Eric and his team pack into their cars and take this Ethiopian family to their new home in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, so we went into the home and began to help them with some of the very earliest things like how to open the lock on the door, the importance of closing the blinds at night, how to work a thermostat. All of these things that, that we take for granted, you know, you just don't think about someone not knowing how to do those things. In fact, for Eric and his team, welcoming this Ethiopian family for the next three months wasn't going to involve anything super complicated. It was going to involve a bunch of really normal, average activities for Americans. Something we've been doing regularly that's been very helpful to them is taking them to the grocery, helping them learn to shop. But just like Eric took for granted knowing how to unlock doors and work thermostats, buying groceries at an American grocery store had its own unforeseen problems. For example, you know, he was able to say we need eggs, and I pointed out to eggs and was kind of trying to educate him a little bit about how we shop for eggs. He immediately picks up organic, which is good and healthy, but not necessarily most economically friendly, you know, to buy. 
So I then try to explain organic difference from regular fruit. So guy's looking at eggs and he's trying to figure out like which eggs are the good eggs when every egg he's ever eaten to this point in his life is a good egg because it's come from his own backyard. He lives organic. Try explaining organic to somebody who's probably never eaten a preservative in his life. <laughs> well, yeah, but the father speaks a little bit of English. I mean, his wife, on the other hand, hasn't been able to learn much yet. So communicating with her can be a bit more of a challenge. And so we were trying to help them understand the water in Louisville is it's okay to drink from the faucet. And my wife had taken a bottle of water that was empty and she put it under the faucet, filled up her bottle of water and went to show the mother that she was going to drink it. And the mother about smacked the bottle out of her hand into the floor because she thought it would be harmful for us to drink the water, you know. But Eric says communication isn't as big of a barrier as you would think. And actually, he's been able to learn some about this Ethiopian family. So we've begun having conversations about what he'd like to do with his life. He aspires to have a business and to be a provider for his family. But there's one topic in particular that seems to be more off limits. They have been open to talking about anything that we ask, but they have not talked as much about the refugee camp experience. Well, in order for us to understand why this topic might be more difficult to talk about, we need to make an important distinction. And that's the distinction between a refugee and an immigrant. An immigrant is someone who chooses to relocate. A refugee is someone who is forced to relocate. And what forces them is extreme violence or persecution in the place where they live. Death or serious harm will result if they don't flee and seek asylum elsewhere. You're actually having to leave because if you don't, you will die in and, and a horrific way. This is John Barnett. John is the executive director of Refuge Louisville, the organization that got Eric connected with the Ethiopian refugees. And he's seen firsthand the effects of being a refugee. You have a lot of psychological trauma for people to deal with being victimized themselves or watching family members killed in front of them. The two images that come to mind that Americans have had to come into contact with, one was the image of the young boy that had washed up on the shore and the image was just of his lifeless body face down. And then the other famous photo that came out was of another boy. He was just sitting there and he was covered in white ash because he had just survived an explosion and a bombing. So especially for me, because I have a son who's about that age, those boys are anywhere from maybe six to 10 years old. I think it's fairly difficult not to superimpose any loved one's face, especially when you're dealing with a child. I think I've looked at both of those pictures like twice a piece because every time I look at them, I see my son and I can't handle it. And it's story after story of some of the most horrific things that you can think of, like a horror movie, but this really happened. So that creates an incredible emotional need. So to help us better understand these needs and what it really means to be a refugee, we talk to this family. <laughs> Coming up, terrorists, a wedding, and a prayer to Jesus. Stay with us. Hey listeners, it's Anna. Over the past seven years, we've had over 300 alumni serve in our urban missions program who've come from all around the United States. This is Queen Sheila from Normal, Illinois. Hi, this is Daryl from New Albany, Indiana. This is Erica from Inez, Kentucky. Taylor from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. They've provided over 130,000 work hours free of charge to local ministries. And along their service journey, they have the opportunity to experience deep community and discipleship that prepare them for their next season of life. Like Gideon Battis from Wisconsin shared with us. I feel like Love Thy Neighborhood taught me that I can't make it through life on my own, but you need the people who are there, the deeper connections, the deeper relationships of those who will come along and when they see that you're not doing well, actually dig in to try to figure out what's wrong, what's going on, and how they can help. If you want a hands-on experience of missions in our modern times, come serve with Love Thy Neighborhood. We offer internships for young adults ages 18 to 30 through the areas of service, community, and discipleship. You'll grow in your faith and your life skills. Learn more at lovethyneighborhood.org. You're listening to the Love That Neighborhood podcast. I'm Jesse Eubanks. And I'm Kevin Jones. Today's episode, where the gospel meets refugees. We're about to hear the story of David and Ishrak, refugees who also live in Louisville. 
Now, the stories we tell on this podcast, they're local, things happening within our own city. But in order to understand this story, we have to zoom out and away from Louisville and travel to Iraq, specifically in the midst of the Iraqi war, because that's where David and Ishraq's story starts. Now, David and Ishraq both speak English, but their first language is Arabic. And in order for them to share their thoughts most clearly, we decided to take a translator with us. Now, the voices you're about to hear, they're actually voice actors helping to share their story with us in English. They come into our neighborhood, into our house, and they killed a lot of people because they considered us unbelievers. Ishraq belonged to the Sabian religion, which was a minority religion in Iraq. So when the Iraqi war broke out and terrorism became rampant, the terrorists targeted her Sabian neighborhood. They killed everybody. Most of my family, my uncles from my mother's side, from my father's side, my cousins. Essentially, they put to death most of the neighborhood, which included most of Ishraq's family. Details from the translation were a bit unclear, but the few people who were left alive were left with broken bones and pieces of glass in their eyes. And a warning from the terrorists. They tell us, you have 24 hours to leave this place or we're going to blow you up. We didn't take anything, whatever we had on us, our clothes, and we just left right after that. No one was going to stick around and see if they really did have 24 hours. They had a chance to get out and not be killed. So Ishraq immediately got on a bus headed for Baghdad. It was a very hard feeling. I can't even express this feeling of seeing my family and my sisters being hurt. I just don't know how to say it. Very horrific things happen to us. Think about that. I mean, it's hard for me to even put myself in that scenario. It would be like this. I mean, here in America, imagine someone breaks into your house, starts murdering people right in front of you, people that you love. They move on to the next house, but promise to come back for you. So you leave all these dead bodies of your loved ones, head out to your car. You can hear the screams of people in the house next door, and you know the same thing is happening to them. You get in your car and you just start driving as far and as fast as you can. Unfortunately, Baghdad was not a safe place either, so Ishraq headed to Syria where she met David, and David experienced his own events that drove him from his home. So my sister was kidnapped by terrorists. They said the only way I could get her back was to pay a lot of money. So David asked his family for money, then he asked his friends for money, and then, Suddenly the terrorists just changed their mind. He doesn't want money anymore. Instead, he wants to marry David's sister. So David takes this as an opportunity to concoct a plan. So I tried to be smart. I said, let us at least see her and we can prepare her for the wedding. And then as soon as his sister returns to begin to prepare for the wedding, David grabs her and they immediately flee to Syria. Man, this sounds like a Hollywood movie. I know, and it's so foreign to most of us, but this, this is their reality. And in fact, as we continued to ask for details about their experiences in Iraq, at one point, Ishraq really just doesn't seem like she wants to talk about it anymore. Alhamdulillah, I would like to move on now. So Syria became flooded with Iraqi refugees, and David was lucky to find work and a house, but it is not somewhere that you can stay permanently. So they apply for refugee status from the government to be resettled, and then they wait. And they wait. And in fact, they end up waiting in Syria for seven years. Hold on, hold on, man. Waiting for what? Why don't they just go somewhere else? Well, because to be officially recognized and resettled as a refugee, it's a pretty detailed process. So let me break it down for you in five basic steps. First, the UN determines if they qualify as a refugee and refers them to a resettlement country. So in this case, that would be the United States. Second, they go through a number of security checks run by both law enforcement and intelligence agencies and have an in-person interview with a Homeland Security officer. Third, if they pass the security screening and everything checks out, they receive a medical screening. Fourth, they get matched with a resettlement agency. So Louisville has two major resettlement agencies. They get security checked again, investigating any new information that has transpired during this whole process. 
5th, they are put on a plane and arrive in the resettlement country, receiving one final security verification upon arrival. And now, after all of these steps, they are finally considered a resettled refugee. So five steps, seven years, David and Ishraq are in Syria. And finally, after seven years of going through this process, David and Ishraq receive the news they are cleared and are going to America. We were so excited that we were going to move to another place where we don't have to suffer anymore. Being resettled also meant saying goodbye to David's sister because she would be resettled in a different country. But Ishraq had an aunt resettled in Boston, another family who had been resettled in Louisville. But in a country of more than 320 million people, Ishraq's handful of family were the only people that they knew. So remember Eric and his team, they're the ones that met the Ethiopian family at the airport when they arrived. Well, David and Ishraq, they didn't have someone like that to welcome them. They had a caseworker from the resettlement agency and were given some maps and locations of places they would need, like grocery stores or hospitals, but that was about it. They didn't know folks here who could help them acclimate. So they decided to seek out some familiarity. While in Syria, David and Ishraq had gotten engaged. And now, three months after resettling in America, they're ready to get married. So they learned that in Michigan, there's a community of Sabians, which, remember, that's their religion. So they go to Michigan to be married in the Sabian tradition. But the church? Well, they ask for more money than David is able to afford. And they're not willing to negotiate. David and Ishraq have no other choice but to leave, unmarried. And then David remembers something he learned while in Syria. He had met some Christians there, and they had been really kind to him. So what we did was we went to the Christian church and they married us in the Christian way. A Christian pastor who speaks Arabic marries them free of charge. Their own people had not welcomed them, but these Christians who believed and lived differently, they did. This is when we first learned that the people of Jesus are one family and they're related by love. David and Ishraq really didn't know who this Jesus was. But what they also didn't know was that he was about to change their life forever. When they came back to Louisville, they decided they wanted to start a family. But the doctors tell Ishraq that she's not going to be able to have kids. Well, the Christian translator who's working with them suggests that they pray and ask Jesus for a baby. So they go to a Catholic church building and they pray to Jesus. And a few days later, Ishraq finds out that she is pregnant. And they are so amazed that they want to name their child after this Jesus who is called the Christ. So they name their first child Chris. So David and Ishraq, they are praying to Jesus. They name their baby Chris after Jesus Christ. And they're not even Christians. Yeah, well, they're not sure exactly who this Jesus is. I mean, they just, they have a lot of dots, just haven't been connected yet. But what they continue to find out is this. This Jesus is some kind of miracle worker. So their first child grows up healthy and strong. And then eventually Ishraq gets pregnant a second time. But this child is born with serious medical complications. So when he was born, he was sick. He had a problem with his brain. We don't know exactly what the problem was, but we know that it was serious enough that the doctors are expecting the child to die at any moment. There's nothing else that they can do. But Ishraq, she thinks she knows who can do something. So Ishraq returns to the same Catholic church and prays again to Jesus. And I said with confidence, Jesus, just touch my kid with your hand to heal him. And that is exactly what happens. The next day, their child starts improving and soon becomes completely healthy. Since then, I was just thinking all the time about Jesus. He is the God of miracles. Anytime I pray for anything, he answers me. Who was this Jesus? They still did not know. And some Christians would tell them, Jesus is Lord. But they weren't really sure what that meant. All they really knew was that this Jesus seemed to care about them. And they would soon find out that his people did too, because when Ishraq became pregnant for the third time, they actually ended up receiving some devastating news. The doctors tell them that their third child will be born with Down syndrome. 
as David and Ishtrak try to come to terms with the realities of having a child with special needs and what that would mean for the rest of their lives, they turn to their family. They hope to get support and encouragement, but their family's response is not what they expected. Both of our families said that we don't need this baby, we, we should just abort it. Their families didn't want the shame that would be brought on them by having a child with Down syndrome, so they give David and Ishrak a choice. Either you abort this baby, or we will no longer be a part of your life. They had been kicked out of Iraq by terrorists, they were refused marriage from their own church, and now they could be disowned by their own family. Coming to America was supposed to mean no more suffering. So what did David and Ishrak decide? So we told our families, no, we don't want an abortion. This started a big problem with our families. True to their word, their families cut them off. So David and Ishrak are raising two kids, about to have a third. They still don't have very good English, and now their support systems are gone. All while living in a country that they barely know and barely understand. David and Ishrak needed help. But who could help them? Where was this Jesus, this God of the miracle now? Being disowned by their family was such a big blow that Ishrak's doctor suggests she go see a therapist to help her get through the pregnancy. And her therapist just happened to be a Christian. And the therapist told her about this really great organization called Refuge Louisville. Here's Refuge Director John Barnett again. They began to realize every time they've had challenges in their life, there's been Christians, there's been believers there to come alongside and to help them. David especially had been intrigued by Christians ever since he met them in Syria. In fact, he had done quite a bit of reading and learning about Christianity, but he was still not able to understand what it all meant, this Jesus and his people. They weren't like the terrorists who hated them for their beliefs, and they weren't like their families who shut them out. Christians seemed to be in this complete other category. They began to ask questions. You know, tell us a little bit more about you know, this love, where do you get that? Why, you're so kind. So when John Barnett went to meet David and Ishrak at their house, David had a burning question in the back of his mind. He sat down, we were talking about a few things, and he said, John, I just hope you can help me answer one question that I've had for my entire life. And I said, well, I'll, I'll try. And he said, who is Jesus? This Jesus who answers when we pray to him? This Jesus whose people are more welcoming and loving than our own people? Who is this? And then I said, well, I, I think we can help you with that. We'll be right back. Here at LTN, we're all about helping people build better relationships. And we've actually created a brand new way to do that with our Say More conversation cards. Say More is a deck of 100 questions to kickstart engaging discussions. So there's silly things like, which famous cartoon character are you most like? And there's also serious things like, what has been your hardest goodbye in life? You can use our Say More cards with your family, your friends, on a date, at the office. My family and I have been using them at the dinner table, and I've learned things about my kids that I truly never knew before. To grab your own deck of Say More cards, Go to lovethyneighborhood.org and click the store link at the top of the menu. And while you're there, grab a couple more decks. They make great gifts for Christmas or birthdays, and all proceeds go directly to support Love Thy Neighborhood. So go to lovethyneighborhood.org and click store and get ready to say more because better relationships are just a question away. Welcome back to the Love That Neighborhood podcast. I'm Kevin Jones. And I'm Jesse Eubanks. Today's episode, Where the Gospel Meets Refugees. We've been following the story of David and Ishrak, refugees from the Iraqi war. They've resettled in America, experienced multiple miracles from Jesus, and they've just been cut off from their family and left alone in a country with more than 320 million people. But there's just one person they really want to get to know. Who is Jesus? And then I said, well, I... I think we can help you with that. So John sat with them and answered their questions. And eventually John asked them if they'd like to come with him to church. And so actually the first service that they went to with us was on Easter Sunday. And it was so great. I was standing next to David and you could just see him soaking things in. 
The next week, David and Ishrak asked John if he would take them to church again. After then, he said, this is the good news. This is what I, I believe. And a few weeks later, David and Ishrak were baptized. Now, as part of celebrating baptism at this particular church, each person getting baptized will write a short version of their story and how they came to know Jesus. Then before the baptism, a member of the church will read the stories out loud. So one Sunday, David and Ishrak are standing before the church congregation, Iraqi refugees dressed in white robes, and their stories get read. Here's a part of that ceremony. But I prayed to Jesus, and again, he answered our prayer. The only people who were willing to help us were followers of Jesus. About two months ago, my husband became a believer, and he shared with me about Christ, and the people from Refuge Louisville taught me about the Trinity. Today, I know that Jesus is a miracle-working God, and that he is my Lord. We are now a Christian family that wants to come to church to pray, serve, and follow Jesus. The baptism ceremony was very powerful for both David and Ishrak, and here's how they describe it. It felt like it was another person, a new person inside. Not like the David from before, but a new person. I stood up and felt differently. Like I was flying in the air and like I didn't feel so heavy. Well, eventually David and Ishrak did give birth to their third child. And I'm happy to say that all three of their kids are doing very well. They say that they're hopeful to grow in their faith in Jesus. And they're thankful to be a part of their Christian family. That's a beautiful thing. Sometimes we, we create these systems in our mind that to be American is to be more God-like. An image bearer is an image bearer. Whether you're born here or in Venezuela or in Dubai or in South Asia, wherever, wherever you're made, you're still made in the image of God. For some reason, we romanticize this idea of Christians going abroad to other nations, but the Lord is literally bringing the world to our doorstep. How are we going to love them? What are we going to do with the people that are standing in front of us? So how's Eric and his refugee friends? Yeah, so Eric and his team have just about hit the three-month mark with the Ethiopian family. I think this last weekend, the family helped them to cook banana bread. This weekend, a family is taking them to the zoo for an outdoor movie, you know, out on the lawn. But they're planning to be friends long after that. Because like David and Ishrak, these Ethiopian refugees, they see their Christian friends not just as friends, they see them as family. The wife, on a couple different occasions, has motioned to the lady on our team who's helping them. And she, because she doesn't speak a lot of English, she would say sister. And she would motion between that person and herself, sister. It's been a super experience. I wish more Christ followers would do that. I really do. At the beginning of this episode, we talked about a statistic from the Barna Group. 16% of evangelicals agree we should welcome refugees during a crisis. That's it. So, John, help me understand, why aren't more Christians getting involved in helping refugees? It seems very difficult. And people say, I don't know if I want to step into that. I mean, are they, am I going to help someone who's going to destroy our country? There's all sorts of issues. Then you're walking a fine line between how do we have compassion and care and how do we maintain security? And I think those are both answered in where does your compassion come from? Is it from Christ and rooted in him? And who's your security in? I think in the end that we are paying way too much attention to what we think and not nearly enough attention to what God has said. In Leviticus 19, God describes to his people exactly what he requires of them. And what he requires is for them to respond to other people the same way he responded to them, with love and with kindness. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God says, Look at what I've done for you. Look at the beautiful things I've done for you. Now you, in return, represent me and do those same beautiful things for other people. And this is exactly what David and Ishrak experienced. You really represent the love of God on earth, and you really represent him as a family. A family not based on culture or political stance, but a family related by love.
All right, so that is where the original episode ended, and we are back here in the studio. In real time. Yep. So I know that you had said that you had an update from John Barnett, but before we do that, my first question to you is, do you actually have an update about David and Ishrak? Yep. So David and Ishrak are doing great. They are still members of the church where they were baptized. Their kids are in school. They can all speak some English now, which makes it you know easier for them to get around and, and do things. So they're doing really, really well. Ah, uh, that's so good to hear. Yeah. And of course, you know, they are super, super thankful for the church stepping in to help them when they were in crisis. And it turns out that the church has had an opportunity to step in in a really big way with all the recent Afghan refugees. Oh, how so? Okay, so as I said, I talked with John Barnett, and he now works for the Kentucky Baptist Convention, but he still works with helping welcome in refugee families. And he said that when all these Afghan families started arriving in the States last October, that there was actually a big problem. Here's John. Now, one of the challenges for the Afghan situation is because it was so quick and so rapid, they came on a short-term visa. Now, that's going to be transferred to be long-term, to be here. But what happened is they're coming in. It's not officially a refugee status, but they will be able to become that. It's one that's done for emergency. Wait, wait, wait. What does he mean? What's that mean? Okay, so here's the problem. Because people were evacuated from Afghanistan so quickly, like we're talking two months tops from when the Taliban took over to when people arrived in Louisville. Wow. Because it needed to happen so quickly, these Afghans were coming in on an evacuee parolee visa. Basically, that means they just needed something official to get them here as fast as possible. But with this short-term visa, That means all the benefits that are usually available to a refugee family, so things like food, clothing, ESL classes, those things aren't as readily available through this type of short-term visa. So they needed to be moved to an official refugee status as soon as possible to get those benefits. But there was another problem. Because the resettlement situation had not been built back up, you know, uh, things had gone down, the numbers had gone down and all of that because of previous administration and different decisions that had been made, you didn't have all the resources. So at this point, while this is all happening, resettlement agencies were kind of floundering. A lot of things had been cut on the administrative level and they weren't prepared to handle such an influx of people. So to be clear... What John is saying is that the Trump administration had essentially decreased funding to the resettlement of refugees and just immigration in general. Right. And so when this crisis arose, essentially the Biden administration had not yet kind of rebuilt itself to be prepared for this kind of crisis. Right. So what's needing to happen in processing paperwork for all these families to get their visas moved over so they can get benefits That's going to take weeks, if not months. And in the interim, all these Afghan families are kind of left hanging. And one of the biggest ramifications of this was, of course, access to food. And so one of the big issues was going to be a food insecurity. We don't have all of the funding and they weren't eligible to get all of the benefits. It's going to take a little while for things like refugees would normally get the food stamps and that. Oh, my gosh. So we're like. Hey, come to our country. We're going to help you. We're going to, you know, protect you from war. But then, like, you get here and we're like, oh, sorry, we actually don't have enough food for you. And also, we know you don't know the language and you can't go get a job to make your own money. But we're also not going to provide all the things you actually need. Yeah, it's like, come over here and, you know, get to safety, but we're not going to be able to help you with anything. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like out of the fire and into the frying pan. Totally. Yeah. So one day, John is in a meeting with these different resettlement agencies and organizations, and this topic of the lack of food availability gets brought up. And so they were kind of talking about it, not nonchalant, they're very serious about it, but it's kind of like, okay, now let's go on to the next issue. I said, well, wait, wait a minute, that's a huge issue. But like we said, I mean, there was really nothing they could do about it. I mean, 
their hands were tied and they didn't really know what they were going to do, how they were going to process this number of people that were coming in, how they were going to help them. Yeah, it's like above their pay scale. It's like we don't get to decide all that resources and the budget and the money and that stuff. Like, Right. Well, and even if they did suddenly have the funding and the resources to provide the food, like there's a dozen other logistics that go into that kind of distribution. It's not just the resources. It's the all the travel, the transportation. They just didn't have the manpower. So this is like a huge deal. But in that meeting, John gets an idea. I said, I think we can help with this issue. Just give me a day or two. Let me talk with some of our leadership. So where John works, the Kentucky Baptist Convention, they have a whole arm of their organization that does food banks. So they looked at their budget and what they had available in terms of funding, being able to supply the quantity of food that was going to be needed. And they said, we actually have the ability to step in here. Wow. And that said, we could do this for all the families coming in across the state for the first three months while they were here. And then that would provide enough time for the resettlement agencies and others to process paperwork and to be able to allow these other benefits that were coming to become available. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but he said that they were doing this across the entire state. Wow. So they are providing food and resources for about 1,500 families. Wow, that's coming amazing. In. And one of the churches that stepped in to help in this way is actually one that you and I share walls with. Wait, Walnut Street? Yep. Walnut Street Baptist, who we rent our office space from. Huh. Here at Walnut Street, um, they already, as a Walnut Street Baptist Church, already run the largest food bank actually in the city. And I believe it, if it's not the largest, it's one of the largest in the entire state. So in order to get this prepared for the Afghan families coming, the first thing they had to do was sort of revamp the process and actually the food itself in order to be, you know, culturally appropriate for these Afghan families. Just taking out certain items and replacing it with others. And we did a little research, got spices that we knew they would like to cook with, food that was there, had Afghan partners um, who could say this would be what would be good. And then, of course, you know, John talked about needing manpower and people to provide transportation and translation and all that kind of stuff. So what they did is they reached out to other churches from all over Louisville, asking them to come help. And that would you be available or have people available to come and to help give rides uh, for families. Great way for you to meet them. We have translators there, uh, people who could help. And so uh, and then you could be able to help take the food back with their caseworker back to their home. Natural way to build relationships. So each time an Afghan refugee arrived here in Louisville, one of their first points of contact was actually the church. Mm, I love that. And so what ended up happening was it became a part of their natural intake. So as families were coming into Louisville and landing, whatever family came over one week, the following Wednesday, they would come to Walnut Street. They had a chance to pick out some clothing for them, whether if they had kids, we had some toys, different things there for the whole family, as well as so everybody got clothes. Everybody got all their stuff for a welcome basket, which means their kitchen, uh, bedding, you know, things like your trash cans and your brooms and all of that. So they could get set up there. And then they got the first amount of food for two weeks. And every two weeks, the families were able to come back to Walnut Street until their paperwork got processed and they were able to receive benefits and start looking for jobs. So what you began to have, which I thought was great, was this beautiful picture of the body of Christ working together, nobody trying to grab certain credit for everybody doing a different role, and that and serving these families. And John actually told me that multiple times he has heard the resettlement agencies tell him they don't know what they would have done if it hadn't been for the church stepping in to help. So it was a great opportunity for the church in the community to say we're here to help. Oh, I love this. You know, this is a wonderful picture of, you know, caring for the poor and caring for the refugee and caring for families in need. And like, it's the church, like being the church, like it's us at our best. 
Yeah. And I think, too, one of the things I love about this is it's not just one church. Yeah. It's like all churches coming together, seeing this gap, stepping in, using the resources that they have to put out into the community. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't think of, like, better people to help, you know, folks that are, like, literally fleeing for their lives in a desperate situation and the church being like, open arms. We're here. We got you. We're going to take care of you. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. And what's amazing is just like what happened with David and Ishrak, many of these Afghan families are starting to ask questions about Jesus and asking about why these churchgoers are helping them and why they do what they do. And John sees all of this stuff as having lifelong impact. But one of the things we've heard over and over again is how grateful they have been for just the different members of the churches who have been real friends with them. And so you're, you're seeing are over and over what I, what I would believe to be lifelong friendships. If you would like to get involved in helping welcome refugees to our city, you can check out Refuge International at refugeintl.org. If you've benefited at all from this podcast, please help us out by leaving a review wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Your review will help other people discover our show. Special thanks to our interviewees for this episode, Eric Allen, John Barnett, and David and Ishrock. Thanks also to our voice actors, Hong Shu and Catherine Fowler. Special thanks also to Samir Bani for translating and to Chris Wilson for letting us tag along with you at the airport. Our senior producer and host is Jesse Eubanks. Our co-host today was Dr. Kevin Jones. Our media director and producer is Rachel Zabo, who has been finally thinking about learning to drive a car. And I've got to tell you, there was a little bit of apprehension, a little bit of, I don't know if we can do this. Music for today's episode comes from Lee Rosevere, Pottington Bear, Little Glass Men, Corey Gray, and Broke for Free. Theme music and commercial music by Murphy DX. If you want a hands-on experience of missions in our modern times, come serve with Love Thy Neighborhood. We offer internships for young adults ages 18 to 30. Through the areas of service, community, and discipleship, you'll grow in your faith and your life skills. Learn more at lovethyneighborhood.org. Which of these was a neighbor to the man in need? The one who showed mercy. Jesus tells us, go and do likewise.